Hello everyone, I'm Paul Taylor, I'm CEO and founder of Thought Machine. And hello everyone, I'm Mark Mullen and I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Atom Bank. I guess I've always had a passion for technology. Uh, I love building things. I love building things that are that are successful. I love building things that you know uh, have an impact on in the world. I think banking is a is about as big a problem as you could get, and um, trying to uh, play our, play our, our own modest part in the in in the revolution that's going on in banking is the uh, is uh, is what gets me up from a, from a professional sense. Well, listen, I think that resonates with me as it happens, because building things is, is absolutely what, you know, I guess, founding a business and, and building a company and ultimately trying to, um, you know, do more than just come to work, earn some money and go home. So uh, uh, building stuff is pretty cool. Yeah, I, I've, I've never been particularly great at the, <coughs> at the just regular job thing. So, uh, you know, if, if you want to be a bit more negative, if you rule that out, then uh, you nearly have to be an entrepreneur. And uh, and I, I I think it's a lot more fun to just to you know start something, build it, and see it grow. I'm sure you'd agree. Yeah. Listen. I, the other thing, of course, is just not necessarily having to work for somebody in the sort of orthodox sense of the word. I mean, you've always got you know bosses, you've got boards, you've got shareholders, so you're never completely free. But by the same token, the idea that you know you can pretty much play with all of the toys as I describe it and do everything in a business is, is, a, is a great privilege. So, you know, it makes every day pretty interesting and different. Gosh, I don't think I could explain banking to a five-year-old that easily, let alone digital banking. But I guess, you know, to, to put it in as plain speak as I possibly could, it's about using computers. And by computers, I mean phones or, you know, literally laptops or computers on your desktop. Uh, to borrow money, to save money, and to make and receive payments. Because that's ultimately, you know, banking's not that mysterious. You, you borrow money from banks, you stick money into banks, and you save it, or you pay people, or people pay you. And, and really, digital banking is about translating all of that activity and, and enabling you to do it on a, on a device, a computer, um, and, and making it, you know, as fast and simple as you possibly can. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I would back that up. I think that's pretty good. It, it's, it's fun trying to explain money in, in any capacity uh, to a child. And I'd also just say that that um, perhaps with the advent of digital banking, we have a, an opportunity to actually explain money differently because when you when you when when money is explained to you as a kid, it's explained to you in terms of, uh, you know, coins and as you get a little bit older notes and things like that. And it's very hard as an adult, as I enter the ban banking industry, to d dislodge that idea from my brain. But of course, in uh, in the banking world, uh, that's only a tiny part of how a bank works. And, and per perhaps if we went on to a digital first view of, of how uh, money flowed and money was created, uh, we might actually get, might, might be closer to the truth of how a bank actually works. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. I, I, I was born, of, I am that old, unfortunately. So I was born in the era where you could look at it, you could actually hold money you could stick it in a jar, you could count it, you could sort of, you could see it grow or you could see it shrink. I guess one of the challenges of digital banking is that, you know, you've dematerialized the whole database. You do, yeah. So, so yeah. It, it may as well not exist. It's virtual and you virtually never have it or you virtually have it. Um, and sort of translating a virtual concept into something that people can truly understand. I guess you're right, Paul, if you're born with that and you've never known anything different, then that's going to be easier because that's normal. But, but for me, you know, it does require a bit of translation. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I definitely think budgeting was easier when we were teenagers or, or in our early 20s because you, you put some money in your pocket, pocket and, and that was it. That was the budget. It's a very good system because, I mean, you can check your balance at any time and you know, you know exactly where it is. And when it runs out, it runs out and you just got to wait till the next, uh, uh, the next bit of pocket money uh, or uh, the next paycheck arrives. And it was a, it was a very robust system in a way. And uh, I, I, the absence of that, it certainly makes people's bu budgeting uh, more tricky. I, I was much better at it when, when I didn't have any money in my 20s than I, than I am today. I, I think digital banking has been very good at a portion of the market and it's been very good. At, it's got very good penetration into the most obvious things that people want to do, especially in kind of day-to-day -day spending, especially on uh, savings, of things like this, but I think we're a long way away from what you call universal banking, uh, universal digital banking, 
And I don't really expect people to apply for mortgages on their phones, but perhaps to be able to do all the things in banking um, online would be uh, would be good. So, is it, so it certainly made sense to do the the day to day things first and, and and get those nailed. But we're a long way away from having from having the full experience there. I think that's probably right. I, um, the extent to which people feel comfortable doing some things on a phone has yet to sort of, if you like, resolve itself. But I don't think there's one thing, you know, I don't think that I can give a packaged answer which says, well, I'll tell you what, if you focus all your energy on this thing, then you'll be ahead of the curve because there's a number of forces that are shaping, uh, you know, digital banking right now. You know, there's so much talk about crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, distributed ledger technology, biometrics, AI. And I think the, the, the businesses that manage to integrate those into a proposition that actually works and does something useful for a customer is a business that will create value. But, but you know, being great at one of them um, is really not what a bank is about. A, bank's a, banking, you know, a bank is a machine. It's, it's bringing a whole bunch of technologies together and making sense of them for a customer. So you know, if you, if you think about uh, crypto, if you think about AI, if you think about biometrics, and, and if you think about tokenization, and can translate that via an insight into a product or a service or a proposition, I think you're gonna create value for people. And ultimately, that's what all businesses do. If you don't create value for people, then you don't have a business. I think, I think that, that the one myth in digital banking that needs to be debunked is that somehow or the other, digital or fintech or technology is going to um, obviate or remove the need for banks. I think it's just a it's, a, it's a misunderstanding about what a bank is. At one level, of course, you know, digitalization can make banking very much easier and faster and more efficient, more insightful. But banking is a, is a set of rules. It's a regulated idea. It's not, um, it's not about physics, it's about policy, it's about process. Um, and it's about leverage. So ultimately, at its heart, banking is about multiplying money and then managing the transformation of that money over time, maturity transformation. So um, the myth that, that somehow or the other you won't need banks, well, come on, you know, Bill Gates said it about 30 years ago. We're still, whether you like them or not, banks are pretty useful institutions. Digital banking can make it a much, much better thing but that's not that's not quite the same as getting rid of banks altogether. That's that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Yes, I I I, I would completely back that up. I I, I think uh, I I would even go so further to say I think banking is here to stay forever. And and it, what's more, in the when I read books books about banking, there are some that talk about all the detail first, but there's some that just talk really about um, the balance sheet and asset and liability management. And and this is an this is essentially what a what a bank is about. It is about storing money. It's about taking deposits. It's about lending it out. And I I, I I don't think anybody's even conceived of a better way of doing it. People have conceived of better ways of perhaps making payments or perhaps storing some money. But it, it is that it, it is that both sides of the balance sheet uh, doing that um, assessing risk and then managing uh, the customer journeys on both sides so that the lenders get a. Uh, good experience uh, as as do the depositors. Now everything else is kind of channels and automation and how do we do it better? Uh, but um, but I, I think in five years time or a hundred years time when we look at what banks do, it'll still at the core uh, be that asset asset and liability management system and and a, a market maker for depositors and lenders and and, and that's an essential function. Uh, and the the I, what we need with digital banks is just to do it ext extremely well, remove friction. And, and just have a, a very well-rounded, very accurate way of doing all those things. I think there's a natural progression and, and people have, um, I'm reading a good book right now called Netflix, which is about the, the, the middle days of Netflix when it was at war of Blockbuster and uh, Blockbuster was, uh, was having a lot of fun and games because it, it had all these stores of VHS cassettes in it and Netflix didn't and all, all, these, all these sorts of things. And I'm pretty sure if you explain that to a teenager today, they, they would, it would take hours, nearly hours to explain it, that you had to walk down to a video shop, that you wanted a video, but you couldn't get that one because that was a popular one. So you had to pick an unpopular one, unless you went down early on a Saturday and then you could get a popular one. Uh, and, and, you know, we just have to go through this phase until uh, we've got properly, proper automated banking 
with everything flowing flowing carefully, everything working well. And as Mark said, you know, the, the, the banks revert to not being, um, you know, managers of complexity, but but revert to being um, asset and liability managers and, and, and to being bankers and, and making good financial decisions, good business decisions on this and, and not be always talking about infrastructure. And very soon, streaming streaming is still uh, still has its hiccups, but but soon streaming will be so automatic that no one will be, conceive of work. We don't really think of radio as a technology, for example, or or, or just uh, terrestrial TV. It just works, and and digital banking will get itself into that space, and we'll will kind of quaintly look uh, look back at the old days of branches and and uh, stacks of money and all and all that sort of thing. But it's but it, we will still think about banking banking as where we store our money and how we move our money. I think that's right. I mean, I think checkbooks today are antiquated, but they're still, <laughs> but they're still in use. I mean, one of the problems, one of the challenges of the banking industry is that it, it, you know, people talk about revolutions. Well, they're the slowest revolutions you've ever heard of, you know, because you've got somebody who's clinging onto their checkbook and really loves it. And cash is antiquated. I mean, you know, one of the, I guess one of the accelerators of, of, of the transformation from cash if you like to 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 the digitalization of currencies, COVID nineteen, the fact that we're all, you know, not wanting to exchange dirty money with people, frankly, is just going to um, drive it a bit faster. So so you know, there's already a bunch of stuff happening in banking that is antiquated. It was antiquated twenty years ago. It's just more antiquated today, which is bloody frustrating because you just can't get rid of it. And if you think about how banks, how bad banks, and maybe it's not just banks, but how slow. Um, governments are to manage obsolescence that, that you know we carry all of this drudgery into the future because people don't invest in the transformation of standards in a society you know one of the bugbears that I have in in banking is the fact that I have to go and identify myself differently to three different banks why do I have to do that I have a passport surely to goodness I can I should be able to translate my passport into a digital token that verifies who I am and allows me to identify myself seamlessly, regardless of which bank I'm dealing with. And yet today, that's just not happening. And the, you know, um, um, people are scratching their heads, thinking, "Well, should it be a private enterprise that does it? Should be a bank?" Oh, hold on, there. I'm a citizen of a country. How difficult is it for that country to digitalize aspects of how it does business? Because if it did you know, it would remove a whole bunch of frictions, not just in banking, but, but, but in a whole bunch of other areas of society. But, but make no mistake, you know, there's lots of antiquation in banking right now, and we can't shake it off, we can't get rid of it. I don't think you need to look any further than the smartphone, frankly. I don't know whether you'd call it a technology or the confluence of a set of technologies, but it seemed to me that, you know, I guess desktop internet banking, which kind of started around the millennium, um, one multiplied the number of transactions and frankly transformed the whole banking industry. But it's, it, the, you know, the smartphone came along and it's been like, you know, banking on speed. That's the only way to describe it. And not just for banking, but for everything and, and, and how we live our lives. And there's been massive upside and massive, you know, benefits to it. But we've also seen some pretty horrid side effects, especially over the last sort of three or four years, I think, as we begin to understand how intrusive that, that set of technologies are. But the idea that you literally can do pretty much all your banking, materially all your banking, anywhere, anytime, any place, in a small device in your pocket, um, is pretty transformational. And the industry still hasn't adapted itself to it. It's still sort of trying to play catch up and trying to understand what in hell's name is going on. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you went first. So, so, so you got the obvious an answer in as well. Uh, I, 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 I will give it. I will give it another. Uh, so of course I, I, I completely agree, but I also think that the back end. I mean, Thought Machine is a platform company in essence, and the revolution that's going on the back end technologies with APIs and the cloud and microservices is it, it, the kind of you know flip side of the phone because you know what is the phone going to connect to, and um, and you can see that users have a. Um, while all the apps look the same, what's going on in the background uh, it isn't. Uh, but when whatever service it is that you're using is 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 in the cloud and has APIs, it just means everything can connect to everything else in a far easier manner, and and uh, that reduces friction and and just makes the whole thing a, a, a lot easier.